Uh, joining us now to discuss the senator's appointment uh, is a guy who knows whereof he speaks. I served with him in the House. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Bob Walker, the former chairman of the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee. Bob, it's great to have you. We just, you. Heard, just heard Dr. Kaku uh, talk about ideology guiding the NASA budget. Couldn't we say a, another ideology has been free spending on a science that is dubious, to say the least? Well, I mean, really, uh, spending on uh, learning more about climate is, uh, is not that um, uh, bad an idea. But uh, what we've had is science that has been mandated to go in a particular direction uh, without um, uh, the kind of scientific method that we usually use that uh, allows uh, the uh, dissent uh, so that uh, we get accurate science in the end. Bob, a lot of NASA's budget goes to fund operations in Houston. So is it possible that he'd actually expand its budget to help the economy of his home state? Well, my guess is that uh, he will be a, um, a, a great advocate for NASA, given his uh, home state. Uh, and uh, there uh, we have a lot of the manned space operations, uh, which is an area that we're attempting to expand through more commercial activity. Uh, and so uh, to have Ted Cruz uh, advocating in some of those areas would actually uh, put some vitality back into the space program. And even as you talk about the change in the space program, we think about historically what was spent in the 1960s uh, during the space race and then by uh, the NASA moonshots, about a penny of every tax dollar was going to space and now it's far, far less. But I also think in another context, about the man who said billions and billions, not of dollars, but of stars, the late Carl Sagan. His successor now on uh, the new cosmos, Neil deGrasse Tyson, had this to say. Let's listen to Dr. Tyson, then get your reaction, Bob. Funding for science under Republican administrations has been historically higher than under Democrats. Knowing this, and knowing that in innovations in science and technology are the engines of economic growth. I may not agree with Dr. Tyson on some of the criticism he has for people of faith, but Bob Walker, is he spot on right there with his well, Neil, assessment? Neil's actually a, a, a good friend of mine, and uh, uh, yeah, he is, uh, he is spot on. Uh, the, the fact is that even during the time uh, when uh, you and I were working to balance budgets in Washington, we managed to put additional money into research and development, and particularly into science and health research, uh, and uh, we expanded out the budgets while we were uh, balancing the budget uh, because we do recognize that science and technology are engines for economic growth in the 21st century. Well, uh, Bob Walker, I can recall those days in the House, and there was a point in time where uh, we were debating the International Space Station, and there was a mighty close vote on the House floor. Now, of course, that International Space Station is reality, Bob, we're going to ask you to stay uh, tethered uh, to us, uh, and we're going to go to a break. We're going to come back and talk about the ISS, about the uh, supposed problems with an ammonia leak, and really our future in space. That and other scientific topics with a man of letters, a man of political science, and obviously the former chairman of the House Science Committee. There's more with Bob Walker when Miranda and I return with you on America's Forum, so stay tuned. That's why we want to continue our conversation with former Congressman Bob Walker, who of course is the former chairman of the Science and Space Committee in the House. Uh, the story yesterday about the International Space Station and a possible ammonia leak. Bob, what's the real deal? What are the facts on that story? Well, it turns out that it was a computer error and it was not an actual leak. But uh, the fact is, when the alarms go off on an ammonia leak uh, in a contained facility like that, uh, and you can have a total toxic atmosphere created, uh, you get the uh, astronauts out of there uh, quickly. And they went and uh, camped out in the Russian uh, section of the space station for a while until uh, they could determine that this was a computer error, not a, uh, an actual leak. So, so, Bob, what precautions do astronauts have to follow under such dangerous conditions while they're up in orbit? 
Well, uh, it's, you know, it is a very hostile uh, place to be. Uh, and uh, the fact that we've had people on orbit for 14 years uh, uh, continuously uh, says a lot about uh, the uh, engineering miracle that the space station really is. But uh, they have a uh, whole set of protocols uh, that they go through as soon as the alarms go off. And in, in some cases, if, they, if there's space debris that they think uh, might um, uh, hit the station, they actually get into uh, the capsules that are attached to the station in case they have to make a quick exit. Space debris, another term for space junk. And yet, Bob, the problem is when it comes to manned vehicles for the United States, we're dependent on hitching rides with the Russians. Now, I know we had the rollout of the prototype of return to manned space program or manned space flight with U.S. vehicles. Got to tell you, Bob, I took a look at the prototype for the new vehicle. It looked to me to be back to the future, like a, like a giant Apollo command module. I realize the technology is eons ahead, but have we squandered our opportunities in space now, having to hitch rides with the Russians? Well, we, we didn't have a good follow-on program when we decided to cancel the, um, uh, the shuttle. I mean, uh, we, we now have moved in the right direction uh, that we have commercial companies that are developing uh, new uh, space vehicles for us, and uh, that that's holds real promise. SpaceX is not only developing a capsule, they're developing a launch vehicle, and, th and that launch vehicle is what just delivered the last uh, uh, bunch of, uh, of uh, stuff to the space station uh, that they need for um, their consumables. So um, uh, we, we have some technologies that are beginning to prove themselves, and hopefully by about 2017, we will have the capability to um, uh, put uh, American astronauts on American vehicles again. 2017, that's great news. What else does the future hold for NASA? Because you well, just I heard that, we're huge Star Trek fans, so we'd love to know. Well, um, I think uh, once we get a, an established American capacity to go to low Earth orbit, we can then begin to think about uh, how we uh, move uh, further out. And uh, uh, we had Neil Tyson on there a few minutes ago. Neil Tyson and I have said to each other uh, on many occasions uh, that uh, we want the capacity to be able to explore the whole solar system with humans uh, in the future. And we ought to not just be thinking about going to Mars, although that's one of the destinations that a lot of people would like, but we ought to be able to think to, to go past Mars to places like Europa. Uh, where uh, we think that uh, if there's a chance that there's life that exists in our own solar system, that it may be uh, on, a, on a moon of Jupiter like, uh, like Europa. Well, that's certainly an ambitious itinerary, Bob. We appreciate your vision. We hope that many uh, in government service now will share it. We'll also watch with interest some of the private endeavors. And of course, we've seen uh, the introduction of Project Orion to get our astronauts back into space. And we'll see if that happens within the next two years. Bob, we're not going to wait two years to talk to you. We'll have you back real soon. For now, thanks Excellent. so much for the time. OK, thank you. Bob Walker, Skyping in from Washington, DC. Uh, when we come back, we follow the edict, leave you laughing, because the news can be tough, but there's the perfect remedy. Laughter is the best medicine, and the lighter side is straight ahead, so stay tuned.